Uh, my name is Travis Salway. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks. That feels good. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm an uninvited settler of European ancestry uh, who lives and works on the Coast Salish lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And I really want to appreciate Florence and Rocky and the rest of our panel for opening the morning uh, in a way that really got me reflecting about both the weight and the light of what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, Florence, I think, uh, what I heard Florence say was, for your light to come through, you have a bit of work to do. So we have a bit of work to do on the panel here. Um, we're gonna do it. We're all really excited. We've been talking for months, some of us years, and uh, we're finally all together. So uh, I think you're in for a treat. So um, it's really my absolute privilege to share the stage with these four individuals who are doing the difficult and important work of bringing light to the issue of conversion therapy in Canada. And I've learned so much from each of you over the last six months. I'm so happy you're here. I'm going to first let each of the four speakers introduce their names, pronouns, and where they're coming from. Uh, then I'll, I'll um, make a few remarks to set the stage. So, Matt. Hello? OK. So uh, Matt Ashcroft, he, him, pronouns, and from Toronto, Canada. I'm Erica Muse, she, her pronouns, from Hamilton, Ontario. Wendy Vanderwall Gritter, she, hers. I am a settler on the traditional lands of the Passamaquoddy in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. Hi everyone, my name is Nick, uh, he, him pronouns, and I'm from Ottawa on the unceded traditional territory uh, of the Algonquin nations. Thank you. So uh, let me just start by framing the conversation we're going to have today, um, and it, it is a difficult one. All queer and trans people experience, for at least some parts of our lives, pressure. Uh, whether it's from family or other adults when we're young or from society generally or sometimes from ourselves, a pressure to repress or discourage or delay or change our gender identity or expression or sexual orientation. And for some people, this pressure becomes more focused at the hands of practitioners of conversion therapy. And the costs of this pressure can be huge. Uh, most fundamentally, it causes delays in coming to accept and affirm ourselves. In some cases, it causes severe mental distress an inability to work uh, or to form social con connections that we need to live and thrive. Conversion therapy is a misnomer. Uh, no one is converted. There's nothing therapeutic about it. Um, to get away from this terminology, I've started using SOGIS, uh, which stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Change Efforts, but this is also imperfect, as we'll see today. Um, conversion therapy practitioners have adopted their language too, and many will argue that they do not, even cannot change one's gender or sexual orientation, but they will nonetheless try to hide, suppress, or delay it. There is not just one setting where SOGIS occurs. It happens in counselor's offices, in licensed physician's offices, in churches, in homes, in camps. There is not just one type of conversion therapist. SOGIS or reparative practices, can, they can involve non-scientific, non-scientifically supported forms of psychotherapy or prayer or denial of access to gender affirming care. All of these practices, however, have two things in common. And here I'm very gratefully borrowing the language of my colleague, Florence Ashley, who has done a lot of great work, uh, could not be here today because Florence is currently serving as a first uh, known openly transgender clerk at the Supreme Court of Canada. Florence has defined reparative practices as having two elements. The first is they involve some kind of treatment or practice or sustained effort. So that means there's an intervention happening, and that intervention can take a lot of different forms, as you're going to hear. Um, and second, most importantly, what does all this have in common? Is that the goal of these efforts is to repress, discourage, or change targeted characteristics that re relate to gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. Um, and after James's beautiful story this morning about the work that he's doing uh, to help trans people access gender affirming care, I started to wonder if the entire healthcare system on the whole is a form of SOGIS. 
Uh, we do not have a lot of empirical data to tell us about the scope of soja ice in Canada, but based on estimates from the US, uh, I think we're talking about somewhere between 5 and 20% of LGBTQ and two-spirit people have experienced it. So this corresponds to tens of thousands of Canadians, and we've heard from very few of them, uh, and that's why we're here today. So before I introduce our first panelist, I want to make some acknowledgments. First, I want to thank the CBRC in particular uh, for their generous financial support for this event and for related uh, efforts to bring together those of us who are working on the issue of conversion therapy, in particular. In particular, I want to thank Michael Quagg and the planning committee for making space for us in this year's program. Thank you. Uh, with us in the audience today, we have uh, someone that is really dear to, to all of us on stage, and that's Matthew Shurka from the Born Perfect Project in the US. Matthew, can you stand up? Where did you go? OK, Matthew is right here. Um, Matthew. I caught you mid-stride, Matthew. Matthew is an activist and a conversion therapy survivor who has worked tirelessly to elevate the stories of survivors, connect them with supports, and enact conversion therapy bans in 18 US states. Um, wow, and he traveled all the way here from New York uh, just to hear our panel. So we're really, really honored that you're here, Matthew. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Peter Geidek, who is a British Columbian conversion therapy survivor whose advocacy work led the city of Vancouver's ordinance banning conversion therapy in 2018, and to the provincial bill uh, here in BC that is currently before our legislature to ban conversion therapy. Uh, on stage today, we have two of the many thousands of conversion therapy survivors, and I want to acknowledge we have a lot more stories uh, to hear. Uh, in particular, uh, notably absent are indigenous conversion therapy survivors, and earlier this week I was speaking with a colleague about this event, and I asked her, have you heard of or have you read any stories from indigenous people who've experienced conversion therapy? And she's just kind of looked at me like, what, what are you talking about, Travis? Uh, all of the stories that I hear from queer and trans and two-spirit indigenous survivors of residential schools are also stories of conversion therapy survivors. Uh, and I went back to read something that Sarah Hunt wrote about what was the intervention of the residential schools. Uh, Sarah Hunt said, residential schools racialized native children as Indians while enforcing strict divisions between girls and boys through European dress and hairstyles, as well as physically separating them in different dorms. It sounds a lot like a sustained effort to repress or discourage gender identity. So this is an outline for our time together today. We're going to hear statements from two survivors, Matt and Erica. Uh, these stories are not easy for them to share, um, and they're not easy to listen to. Um, and I'm so grateful that you're both here. <laughs> Um, for taking the time and energy to do this. Um, we all need to take care of ourselves during this session, so um, you are all invited to come and talk with me or any of us uh, after if you're feeling distressed. Uh, it's, that's a very normal reaction to what we're going to hear. Uh, we have, I see Mumtaz, Alvaro, uh, Aaron are in the room. So we have three counselors in the room, and um, so Mumtaz, Alvaro over there, Aaron's over here. Um, if you need to take a break from this, please, and you want to have someone by your side, please grab one of them or grab a friend. Uh, we're also going to hear from Wendy. Thank you, Wendy and Nick, about future directions for how are we going to change institutions so that this stops happening. And then with the remaining time, we're going to have a dialogue on stage. We're going to address some of the outstanding questions about SOGIS, the future of SOGIS. If you want to suggest a question, um, I will fix the ment <laughs> that's not going to work, X, 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 X. Uh, we'll fix that code. We're not going to be taking questions from the mics. Uh, we're going to ask instead that you use your phone or borrow your neighbor's phone and enter a question through menti.com. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll fix that in a minute. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, all of us, everyone has a role to play in this. So what I want you to do while you're listening to these four speakers is ask, where do you find yourself? What aspects of this work, what, what values, what forms of dignity, what voices of queer and trans people uh, need to be elevated and what can you do to do it? And at the end, at the very end of our session, we're going to offer some suggestions for you. OK, so now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Matt. Uh, so Matt Ashcroft is a conversion therapy survivor. His goal is to see the end of this harmful and devastating practice. In his pursuit to do so, he travels around his native Canada and the United States to bring awareness to the damage caused by such atrocious pr practices on LGBTQ2 youth. He also speaks to support the passage of S-260, a bill whose passage would create 
a safe space for vulnerable LGBTQ2 plus people. Matt has been featured in the CBC, Out Magazine, Gay Star News, and Thomson Reuters. He also partners with No Conversion Canada, a national grassroots coalition looking to end conversion therapy in Canada. Outside his work to end conversion therapy, Matt is a student at the University of Toronto and hopes to be a registered psychotherapist. Please join me in welcoming Matt. Oh. I really, um, first of all, I just want to thank the CBRC for just giving me this space. Um, you know, it's, um, this entire road has been really challenging, and just for you, for you all to like wanting to hear my story and to give me space, like I never thought I would have this. So thank you. <sighs> Let me give myself a kiss. So, essentially, my story in this is um, I'm going to start with my parents, um, specifically my dad. So my dad is a Jamaican guy, um, specifically Rastafarian, and um, he was homophobic, that, or had homophobic words, essentially he said some nasty things to me when I was growing up and made me afraid of him. So that fear turned into religion, and I turned to religion to see if I can get the love and acceptance of my dad again, and that didn't work either. Um, so I essentially stayed to myself, knowing something about myself that, um, was, that, that I knew that was not acceptable in his home. So I basically stayed, stayed inside, went into the wormholes on the internet, and I found this private Facebook group where people were promoting a very well-known conversion therapy camp in the United States. Um, I didn't attend, or I didn't, I, I was basically watching people promote this, and so they were promoting, 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 and I eventually pulled the trigger and I went in Pennsylvania. So, um, when I went there, I had a ride with somebody. Um, there, uh, this person was, we, we arrived there and we had to sign a waiver. Um, so the waiver was, I don't even remember what was on the form to be quite honest, but it was essentially a waiver to, um, I, would, I would say, uh, use fear and intimidation. Um, because I had no idea what I was signing myself up for. Um, I remember me signing this and then walking out and um, saw this guy with a stick, like a stick like this. And in a deep voice, he was like, why are you here? And um, I was just like, to me, that was an attack to my gut. It was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. What do I do now? Um, and I would continue to walk, and um, there would be the same people that were um, asking some questions. The final person was saying, what was your greatest fear? And I said, my greatest fear is to not to have the love and connection with my dad ever again. Proceeded to go into this room. If you can imagine, um, it was a small room and on the, on the windows they were taped with trash bags so the trash bags were taped so that way that nobody can look in and nobody can look out. And um, as a table right here, um, you would see, without the table, you would see a, a bunch of other people um, sitting around a circle, and there would be a statue with these, um, these figures, these clay, clay figures, hugging each other, four of them, something that you would get at a craft store. But, and then there would be a candle, and everybody just looked at the camp, candle. And that is the start. 
So I'm going to share three stories that I have either witnessed or I've been a part of myself. Um, that because if I go too much into the weekend, it's just going to be too long. The first thing that I uh, that I was personally a part of was they attribute being gay as an overprotective mother and an absent father. Or if you were sexually abused, they would reference sex abuse. Um, so since I was already angry with my dad, sorry, um, since I was already angry with my dad, my dad, I thought that my dad made me gay just because of his bullying towards me when I was growing up. So, um, so they made me vision my dad and there was a punching bag horizontally and I had a baseball bat and I would hit that punching bag repeatedly over and over and over again, cursing and screaming my dad, uh, at my dad. And um, the, one of the leaders that was there grabbed me on my back, just grabbed me. And I was forced to look at a mirror at myself crying. I could not move my arms. And I was, I was done. I was, I was just so emotionally tired. The second thing that I witnessed that is, um, that is very, I, I feel that is very important in this is, um, one of the one of the participants, one of the conversion therapy survivors that um, that I know, um, he was talking about his story about his older cousin being uh, sexually assaulting him. So he's telling the story to like some of these leaders, and he said, uh, and the, one of the leader, he said, "Stop! What did you say during this? Oh, you're hurting me! Stop it! It hurts! Stop doing this! I don't want this to happen anymore! Stop doing this! Stop!" So the leader went to two other leaders and whispered to, uh, to themselves. He said, did it look like this? Pretended to be him and his older cousin and act out the rape in front of him while saying the words that he was saying. And I just, I saw this guy screaming and crying and yelling, stop, 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 stop. And I'll never forget that. The last thing that I seen um, is someone who is identifying or is wanting to identify as trans. Um, for the sake, I'll use non-binary pronouns for this person. They were told to be stripped down to their underwear. Um, they were told to be stripped down to their underwear because um, just like the show, like uh, imagery of men and what, it, what it's supposed to look like. And um, we were told to roll up this blanket and roll it up tightly so they can crawl underneath the blanket and to be birthed into their manhood and to look at the mirror and say, you are a man. This is, this, this is you, look at yourself in the mirror. This should not happen to nobody. This really should stop. There's nothing therapeutic about this and it's absolutely disgusting that you can treat people like that and I will never on my watch, I'll do anything that I can to let not have this happen to me or to anybody else like me, because it's horrible. So thank you again for listening. Take a breath and say hi to your neighbor. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, okay. Erica, so uh, 
Erica Muse is an activist and a writer from Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, she graduated from the University of Guelph, Guelph with a BA in English and Women's Studies in 2016. She is a survivor of care, th conversion therapy at CAMH's Gender Identity Clinic for Children and Youth and presented to the Ontario Legislature on behalf of Bill 77, uh, the Affirming Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Act that's banned conversion therapy in the province of Ontario. Um, I'm so happy you're here, so please join me in welcoming Erica. I want to say thank you to Travis Selway for having me on this panel and the CBRC for hosting this conference. Oops. <laughs> and since I know she's watching, I'm also just going to say, hi, mom. <laughs> My experience with conversion therapy does not feature religious doctrine, unaccepting families, or many other hallmarks that people associate with it. Instead, my story is inside the health system, mandated by the provincial government, funded by the public purse. I came out as trans at 16 to my supportive, if understandably anxious, family. I immediately tried to find the necessary care for my gender dysphoria, including hormone replacement therapy and sexual reassignment surgery. The age of administration for hormone replacement therapy is very important. The younger that is administered, the better the results are. Therefore, knowing that I wanted physical changes in order to make my body match my gender identity, I pushed hard for hormone therapy and referral for surgery. No one in my city of Hamilton, an hour outside of Toronto, would help me. The only clinic that was actually approved to diagnose and prescribe affirmative care for trans people was the Youth Gender Clinic at CAMH, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. All care in the public system had to go through that clinic. My intake at the clinic was brutal and dehumanizing. I was forced to explain my entire medical history, undergo a battery of mental health tests, and describe in detail my entire sexual identity to mental health practitioners I had met that day. Worse yet, this entire process occurred with a class of students watching behind a one-way mirror as I, again only 16 years old, had to describe my entire sexual fantasies. This was mandatory in order to receive treatment. I was placed into an intensive therapy program. I saw the head of the clinic twice a month for half-day sessions. During these sessions, he would choose a part of my identity and systematically break it down, questioning me as to why I was the way I was and who I thought I could possibly be. To him, every part of my identity was something to question, to disrupt, to be changed. I remember hi trying to hide books I brought to read for fear that he would make me explain my interests in them, that he would berate me for liking them. He took apart every experience I had ever had with gender issues, any time I'd identified with women. Everything, anything that I liked that could possibly be seen as feminine, any desire I expressed that he thought was inappropriate. Each of these experiences was argued, twisted into something to be ashamed of, something to hate. I was taught to hate myself, that my desires to live as a woman were something to feel guilty about, and that I was wrong to have those desires. Every time I talked to him about issues I had with my identity and my gender, what bathroom should I use, how I couldn't look in the mirror at myself or at my body, how I didn't feel comfortable around men, he dismissed me and my concerns. He did not, not act in a therapeutic manner towards me. While this therapy went on, my body continued to change due to puberty. I remember crying when I came in for a session and the therapist commented on how I was filling out, becoming more masculine, my shoulders broadening and my rib cage filling out. He was denying me the medicine I need to stop these changes I hated, and he knew that he was forcing them upon me. Because of the destructive talk therapy he was putting me through and my bodily changes due to puberty, my mental health became worse and worse. I fell into severe depression and only finished high school due to the support of several great teachers. I wanted to go to university for my first year as a woman, but he wouldn't let me. He instead thought that I should go, make new friends, and that that would fix my mental health issues. He cut me off for a year from therapy and my body continued to become more masculine. That year in university, I joined many student extracurriculars, made some friends, had a good time. While my mental health continued to deteriorate, I bombed a course in my second semester as I was too depressed to turn in the course paper. I returned to the therapist after my first year and explained that my health had not improved despite the change in my conditions. He continued to see me for less frequent therapy sessions, always making me justify myself, my interests, my identity. I always ended each session saying that my goal was to start hormones and get surgery. I became so depressed and traumatized that I couldn't even go to many of my appointments with them anymore. I would hole up in my residence at the university for weeks, never leaving, even for my classes. I failed the entire winter semester of my second year, 
dropped out of any social commitments on campus, and effectively became a ghost. I had become trapped in a vicious cycle. I would be severely depressed and eventually pick myself up again to the point where I could slightly function. I knew that I had to transition in order to improve my mental health, and I would return to the youth gender clinic for more treatment. More therapy there would break me down and lead me back into severe depression, and the cycle began again. This continued for the following years. I was a student with lots of potential, ruined by my trauma, depression, and anxiety. I was always behind when I wasn't completely failing my courses. Again, only a very supportive student resource team at my university allowed me to continue learning, even as I fa completely, repeatedly failed and had to retake classes. I kept going back to see the therapist. Eventually, I think he gave up on me. He had been seeing me for seven or eight years, coming in and out of his office, and nothing he had done was stopping me. I always came back. I was asked for the same two things, hormone replacement therapy and a surgery referral. My mental health was getting worse and worse. His conversion therapy wasn't working. At our last session, he finally gave me the referrals I'd always wanted. He said he was done with me, that he couldn't help me anymore, and gave me what I'd wanted for eight years. I was too traumatized to ever follow up on those referrals. Having pa finally passed his tests and reached my goal, I was too hurt to use them. It, had been close to, it has been close to a decade since my experiences at that youth gender clinic. I slowly pieced myself back together as a person. I graduated with my degree in English and Women's Studies. I found a healthcare provider who prescribed me hormones, and I finally had sexual reassignment surgery last year. I worked to get a bill passed in Ontario. <laughs> I worked to help get a bill passed in Ontario to defund the youth gender clinic and make what happened to me illegal. But the scars of my trauma remain. They are physical, but they aren't wounds. They're bones too big, a voice too deep, a body that will be in my prison for the rest of my life. He could have saved me, but he didn't. And I am still severely depressed, anxious, and traumatized by my experience. Only now at 30, 14 years after I first went to CAMH, am I finally able to work. I've been on government disability because of the after effects of what did, he did to me. My grand accomplishment? Becoming a grocery clerk. Florence Ashley, who we mentioned before, a trans legal scholar, has offered a definition that I find helpful in explaining my experiences. I wasn't changed in therapy. He wasn't trying to convert me back from male to female. It was worse. He taught me that I was broken, that I needed fixing, and that he was the only one who could fix me and make me a whole person. Therefore, what I call, I call what I survived reparative therapy, not conversion therapy. Reparative therapy shattered me as a person. I have little to no self-esteem, little identity, no faith or confidence in myself. The therapist stole all that from me. As a trans woman, when I came out, I was trying to find myself to be the person I want myself to be. He stole myself from me, and only a decade later, I'm beginning to find myself again. Now, I don't just want to talk to you about what happened to me. I want you as healthcare providers to learn what you could do to stop it from happening to others. Travis, our panel coordinator, introduced me to the idea of minority stress. Minority stress is defined as a stressor that exists not just at the personal level, but that affects all members of minority community, and eventually leads to personal that community. Cam H's treatment of trans people, both of the youth gender clinic I attended and the complimentary adult clinic, was a significant example of minority stress for Ontario's trans community. Cam H was already infamous for performing reparative therapy when I came out. I remember looking at web pages of bad experiences at Cam H the night before I came out. I was hoping that somehow I'd escape, that I wouldn't have to go there. I remember a trans support group I attended in university and how he tried to come up with any possible way to not have to go to Cam H for treatment. It was impossible. Ontario's healthcare system forces all to go to, to all to go there for public treatment. The therapist that I saw at CAMH is internationally published, an editor of prestigious journals, a wealthy man. His work at breaking me and people like me brought him fame and fortune. Trans people in Ontario bear significant stress and trauma, trauma from being forced to go to CAMH for decades. We're suspicious and wary of healthcare providers, always scared of being hurt again. And this is added to the usual traumas of, health, of trans healthcare. Are we included in our care in a positive matter? Will the doctor respect our identity, our name, our gender? Can we receive affirming health care? How long will it take to get that health care? How many tests must we pass, or, or what gates must we pass through in order to justify ourselves to you as healthcare practitioners? What I want you to know is that trans people have experienced many traumas like mine. For many of us, our identities are livable or not livable because of decisions you make, whether you help us or not. When we ask for trans-affirming health care, we want to be ourselves. We want to have a body that we can feel safe in, that we don't hurt, that we can care for and love ourselves. We need your help. You should know that whoever you are, whatever you care you give to the trans population, we are always talking about you. We are always trying to help each other out, 
find each other care, helpful and caring practitioners and warning each other away from hurtful and traumatizing experiences. When you care for a trans individual, you're not just caring for that person. You're interacting with an intensely marginalized and oppressed community. You can help them or you can hurt them. Which will you do? Thank you so much, Erica and Matt. Um, we're going to uh, shift gears a bit, and we're going to hear uh, some reflections from Wendy and Nick about what it will take uh, from institutional leadership and politicians to end this practice. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Wendy Vanderwall Gritter, who has served as Executive Director of Generous Space since 2002. Uh, her work to acknowledge, apologize, and eradicate the harm of conversion therapy has been documented by the CBC, McLean's Extra, Broadview, and Huffington Post. Um, and I'll add that when I first started to understand the topic of conversion therapy, Wendy was the one who uh, very generously connected me with um, almost 20 survivors so far, so um, really doing a lot of work connecting people uh, in this movement. Um, and so over to you, Wendy. Thank you. It's not so easy to be a straight, cisgender Christian pastor in a space like this. It's not so easy because I know that I represent pain for quite potentially many of you in this room. Uh, as my bio said, for the last 15 years I have been trying to embody what a living apology might be. A good apology expresses regret accepts responsibility, and makes restitution. When I came in 2002, I was a recent seminary grad and completely naive about what the organization that had just hired me was actually doing to LGBTQ2S plus people. It was the stories of survivors that educated me and broke my heart. And I heard stories of harm that had nothing to do with the faith that I had committed my life to. And so the idea of expressing regret seems not nearly sufficient. There isn't any way that I can adequately express the sorrow that I experience when I encounter hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of survivors sharing their deepest pain with me. It's very difficult to accept responsibility, uh, and yet I want to be here today without any excuses, but to say that even well-meaning people of faith have done irreparable damage. And we can only accept responsibility if we want to be part of the solution. I can't make any restitution, but I can commit my life and my work to seeing change happen. And so a few years into my role, we completely changed the organization that I serve. Today, this organization has more than 30 groups that run across Canada that connect LGBTQ2S plus folks who either still center faith in their life or who have had to deconstruct and abandon faith because of the harm that they experienced. Many of our fellowship groups have survivors of SOGICE. We like the acronym a little bit, but we have no idea how to pronounce it. Um, in my tradition, we talk about confession. We talk about repentance. And those terms have been used as weapons and yet, for me, they are the tools that I carry as one who must confess to do the work of justice. And repentance, as in changing your mind, is the tool with which I go forward to try to create peer support-based safer spaces for survivors all across Canada. 
when people who have been immersed in religious communities have been deeply shamed from their earliest imaginings of feeling different, there can be a profound isolation and devaluing of oneself. And it is in community, in finding other survivors, in sharing stories, in hearing validation, in being affirmed in their beautiful dignity and worth, that some degree of healing and moving forward can happen. I'm profoundly grateful to the survivors who spent emotional labor in ways that I didn't even understand at the time to help me understand how deeply this harm goes, how pervasive and absolutely debilitating it can be for years. And so our staff are always available to the survivors in our community. Our survivors experience peer-based support, but the reality is there is much more resource and support needed. We have folks across Canada who need long-term therapeutic care from someone who will not only understand what they experienced from the perspective of their sexuality or gender identity or expression, but understand the nuance and the complexity of someone who is seeking still a vibrant spiritual life and yet to dismantle the incredible harm perpetuated by religious systems of oppression. This therapy can be hard to find and it can be expensive. And so I plead with you, those of you who are practitioners in the room, that you would um, equip yourself with an understanding of the spirituality that survivors want to carry forward into their lives. Uh, I have heard difficult stories from survivors who say that uh, LGBTQ2S positive practitioners have simply said to them, just get rid of religion. And what they're doing is re-traumatizing someone who was told, just get rid of your sexuality. And now they're being told a very similar message, just get rid of your faith, just get rid of your spirituality. And it is almost akin to amputating another part of themselves. For those for whom this is uh, such a steeped part of their identity and being, we need such incredibly sensitive and equipped practitioners. But we also need to hold religious leaders accountable. And that is where a nonprofit like ours comes into play. And so uh, earlier this year, we launched a campaign called Pastors Stopping the Harm. We want to hold religious leaders accountable to not only confess and repent, but to be active agents of change. And so we asked pastors, in, particularly in the Canadian context, to sign on to the following statements. We believe that LGBTQ2S plus people are created in the image of God. Again, these are pastors, so it's distinctly religious language. We believe LGBTQ2S plus people are beloved of God. We believe that God's plans and purposes for people are good and do not result in shame, self-hatred, depression, suicidal ideation, or death by suicide. We acknowledge that efforts to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity have proven ineffective and harmful. We repent of the harm done to LGBTQ2S plus people in the name of Jesus, again, particularly Christian practitioners. We pledge to participate in pursuing justice for LGBTQ2S plus people and we call on our fellow pastors and religious leaders to cease any spiritual interventions with the purpose of changing an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. <laughs> to date, we have 350 plus pastors who have signed on to this campaign. There are thousands of Christian pastors in Canada. This is barely a drop in the bucket. And if I'm honest, most of those signatories are from the choir, from the affirming churches, the mainline churches like the United Church of Canada, the Anglican Church, the Lutheran Church, a few Presbyterians. 
The fundamentalists and evangelicals where most of this harm is happening in deeply hidden ways that may not ever be really addressed by legislative and ban initiatives, that's where the harm is continuing to happen. That's where the exorcisms are being attempted on vulnerable 13-year-olds. And so our work in maintaining relationships with religious leaders, of, of sticking it to them to hold them accountable for this harm, for sharing stories of survivors, for connecting survivors, for giving them the support that they need to be able to go back to their religious communities where possible and share the impact and the influence of harm is the only way we can get at some of these deeply systemic, colonizing shaped oppression and injustices. Sometimes I hear in the queer community a desire to keep religion at arm's length. And I completely understand that. But it is the vibrant faith and spirituality of LGBTQ2S plus people, like we saw this morning with our beautiful indigenous leaders that were speaking. It is your spirituality that will change the tide of religious leaders. It is the way that you embody the values of faith and goodness that will change the hearts and minds. And so, um, I'm done. But I just... <laughs> In both the heartbreak and the hope, I'm just reminded that it takes all of us. And that there, I want you to know that there are those in the religious community who are deeply, deeply committed to accepting responsibility and to working for change. Thank you. It takes all of us. So our last speaker is Nicholas Shava, who's a manager of policy and government relations with a public affairs firm, um, and more importantly for our purposes, the executive director of No Conversion Canada, a national gra grassroots nonprofit coalition that is working to ban conversion therapy in Canada. Nick. Um, I think I want to begin uh, by stating the obvious, and we shouldn't have to, but I think it's important, and that is the fact that we're here today, that we're having this discussion, um, the fact that folks like Erica and Matt are sharing their experiences and calling for action, the fact that we're doing this, and this is still happening in Canada in 2019, uh, should be a profound source of shame to elected officials across this country. Um, <clears throat> and I don't say that to be inflammatory, I say that because of what's at stake. Um, we're talking about life and death. When, um, you know, when individuals experience conversion therapy, um, their mental health, uh, their well-being, their physical safety, their validity, uh, their social interactions, their community are all at risk, but so are their lives. We know that individuals who experience conversion therapy are more likely to attempt suicide. And so it's important that when we talk about this issue, we are crystal clear about what it means. It's life and death. Conversion therapy bans save lives, or at least they help save lives. Now, as this movement grows, there are going to be opponents who are going to try to interrupt uh, the progress that we're making. And you can be sure that they will use fear and they will use misinformation. And they will try to frame this issue in terms of freedom of expression or freedom of religion, um, but this is not the case. Conversion therapy is a public safety issue, it is a human rights issue, and if need be, it is a criminal justice issue. And so it's really, really important that the language we use uh, and the terms that we set for this um, are crystal clear. It's also important to acknowledge that this is not something new. Uh, conversion therapy has existed in Canada in some form since the 1950s. It accelerated in the 1970s and it exists today. Um, this is actually one of the, the toughest points and I'm sure my panelists will agree um, in Canada is that you know, we have made progress for the LGBTQ2 community. We have a prime minister who marches in pride parades. Uh, and so you have almost disbelief that this is still ongoing, but it is. Likewise, the movement to end conversion therapy um, has existed for many, many years, decades. This is a movement that was started by survivors, 
It's led by survivors, uh, and they own this movement. Um, they, have had, they have had excellent advocacy over the years, and I think those voices are only getting louder and more organized today, and that makes me really, really happy. Um, I myself am not a survivor of conversion therapy. I don't have lived experience, and I'm very open about that. Um, my background's in policy and, and government relations and politics. Um, and so, for me, what I noticed was that there was amazing advocacy and work being done uh, across Canada at a municipal level, at a regional level, um, but it was quite dispersed. And so the whole idea behind No Conversion Canada was to unite these voices, to create a common message and a common banner, to amplify the voices of survivors and to center those voices and take that fight directly to Ottawa. So No Conversion Canada, we are supportive of uh, legislation at every level of government. So at a municipal level, typically what this looks like is uh, prohibiting business licenses or land use by uh, organizations or companies that commit conversion therapy. Um, currently, there are four municipalities across Canada that have done this, and the first actually was here in Vancouver, uh, thanks to one of the pioneers uh, of this movement, Peter Guidich, uh, who Travis mentioned earlier. Um, at a provincial and territorial level, um, typically this looks like outright bans uh, through the healthcare system, um, often um, targeting minors, so those who are 18 years of age or younger, and this prohibits uh, registered uh, therapists or health professionals uh, from committing conversion therapy. Much like municipal bans, provincial and territorial bans um, are good, they're a good first step, and I'm very supportive, uh, but they also have their setbacks, and that's largely because of jurisdictional issues in Canada's legal and political system. Um, so right now we have bans in Nova Scotia, Manitoba, and Ontario. Um, and Ontario was uh, actually co-authored by our very own Erica over here. Um, yeah. And we've seen promising signs uh, coming out of PEI, uh, Yukon, and here in British Columbia. So we're optimistic for that as well. Uh, but for me, and for No Conversion Canada, I really want to see this at the federal level um, because we need a blanket ban so that it's equal, and really what we're talking about today is equality. Um, and there's many different ways that this can look like. Um, last year, uh, a senator named Senator Serge Joyal introduced Bill S-260 in the Senate. Uh, this was the first of its kind in terms of conversion therapy legislation at a federal level, and this criminalized the promotion or the profiting of conversion therapy in Canada. Um, now it made it to its second reading, and when Parliament resumes in a few weeks, it will be dead uh, just because of the nature of our system, um, which isn't actually the worst news because I think the legislation can be stronger, and I definitely think there can be more consultation with survivors and the queer community. Um, but what I would like to see is an update to the criminal code. So what that means is that anyone who practices uh, or commits, sorry, conversion therapy would be in violation of the law, and this could extend to revoking charitable status for uh, organizations that commit conversion therapy, um, as well as other avenues. Um, I was having a conversation with Matthew Shirka yesterday, and one of the avenues that's being explored in the United States is um, survivors challenging their, their therapists, their registered health professionals, on the basis of consumer fraud. So essentially saying that you advertise that this would change my sexual orientation or my gender expression, and that's of course not the case. And in the process, I've suffered incredible trauma, um, and these challenges have actually been successful. So that's another avenue in terms of legislation and, and uh, legalese that can be explored. Um, finally, there's a civil society angle that's really, really important. Um, so you have organizations like the Canadian Psychological Association that have come out and put out a statement saying that this is harmful, that this is dangerous. Uh, you also have the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers who have created an internal policy that says any social worker with, with an affiliation to conversion therapy is barred from practicing uh, in that province. So it's really, really important to have that top-down uh, structural change, but also to have that bottom-up uh, change as well. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, and I guess I would just say this. Um, this past election, four of the four major parties addressed conversion therapy, and they said they were against it. Now, what their definitions are, that remains to be seen. But three out of the four went so far as to say that they would ban it federally, and they put that in their platforms, and that is a promise they made to you. They owe that to you, they represent you, you elect them. And so I hope that together we can hold them accountable and make sure that they keep that promise. 
um, because if there's one thing that we do exceptionally well as queer people, it's organized and mobilized for our civil and human rights. Uh, and so we, we should keep doing that. Thank you. I'm Tom. Um, aren't they incredible people? And they, they came all this way to share their stories with you. Um, we, I'm gonna, I, we're right up against the break, but uh, we got started a little bit late, so I'm gonna ask for your collective permission to just take five minutes into the break time. <laughs> I got a thumbs up from Michael, so I'm golden. Um, so for, for the panel, um, first, Matt, Erica, is there anything you want to add, kind of having everyone had that chance to speak? Yeah, I, uh, I would like to add one thing to what Nick said, which is that when we did the provincial ban in Ontario, one important element was that it was able to delist conversion therapy as a service that healthcare practitioners could provide under provincial health care plan. So it was important to get that passed at the provincial level because that's where healthcare funding is provided and therefore people couldn't provide conversion therapy services count, counting it out of the public purse. And that was my experience. My, my conversion therapy was actually paid for by somebody's tax dollars and that's completely reprehensible. And I further want to go ahead and say that I completely disagree with everything Wendy just said. I am someone whose faith was very important in her recovery from conversion therapy. I identify as a pagan universalist I have run out of microphone here. And I don't think that an apology like that does any good to any of us. I don't think that apology, that self-serving bullshit, does anything to actually help us as survivors recover for what happened to us. And I don't think that it did anything good. I think if anything, it was re-traumatizing. And I think it's absolutely reprehensible that she would come up here and try to co-opt this experience and us sharing our story as survivors to position herself and try to give this half-hearted disavowal of her own experiences as someone who is a practitioner of conversion therapy. And furthermore, that if she wonders why we as a queer community are distrustful of the Christian church, this is the kind of apologies they give when they get called out on their stuff. And if you want to improve and help us as survivors, don't listen to anything she said. Matt, do you, wanna, do you have anything you want to say? Um, hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you names. Dean, Avi, Jay, Adam, Eli, Jim, Calvin James or CJ, Jerry, Rocky, Aaron, and Steven. Those people are the people that were in my conversion therapy camp. I don't know if they're dead or alive, and it's because of that. One thing we have to realize as well is that it's very hard for us to like come out and actually speak about something like this because it is completely different than any what a lot of people experience but it's also one and the same we you know it's like i i look at i look at some of the people that i when the camp, I'll just give it an example of Jerry. After the camp that had happened, um, Jerry would send me memes of himself, uh, fat shaming himself and saying that he's too ugly and, and then he just disappeared and I never talked to him again. This could be anybody that you know. You don't know what people are struggling with silently and it's, and it's good for anybody to give a space to voices that are not really heard because if it, we're here together, this, that's the most important thing is for us to be a collective. So let's do this together. And thank you so much for listening. It's really thank important. You, thank you. So 
thank you um, to those of you who submitted questions. Um, we're really tight on time, so we're just going to give each of the panelists a chance to answer one question, uh, facilitator's prerogative, that is summing it all up um, in one sentence. One, sen <laughs> one sentence answer, starting with Matt, Erica, Wendy, Nick. Uh, what is one thing you would like the members of the audience to do when they leave here today, reflecting on what they've heard? The biggest, most important thing to me is how can we create therapy and better models for helping victims and survivors move on with their lives and heal? Can you pass? Oh, you want to go now? Go ahead. Um, one thing that I would like to see is um, a proper use of the term equity, uh, whether, it's, whether it's religion or non-religion, we have, we have a voice and we amplify our voices and we want to do this as a collective because we deserve it. We deserve it as a queer community. Our community is beautiful and it's diverse. It is diverse. So, that, so it's really important for us to come as a collective and um, to, and like, raise your hand if you know of a straight person that has to go through what we go through. That was a dumb question, but still, at the end of the day, sh sh straight people have no idea what we go through. Thanks, Matt. Wendy? I would repeat what Erica said. I think it is about resources and supports for survivors. Thank you. Um, I would say hound your elected officials. Call them, show up at their offices, tweet them, um, email them. Uh, they serve you and they can create change. Um, I also just wanted to flag, if we have time really, really quickly, um, on your tables there are uh, some signs that we had printed. These are affirming messages for this movement. Um, I wanted to know if everyone could hold up a sign or two when we were trying to get a picture. One, because I think it's a, it's a really uh, important image, but also because <laughs> symbolically, um, when we stand together, uh, we are stronger. So if you could all just hold that up, we're going to try to get a really quick picture. Thank you, everyone. T t really quick, really, really quickly, um, Matthew, who is here from Born Perfect, has organized a gathering for conversion therapy survivors and friends. You're our friends now, so join us uh, at Numbers on Davie Street at 8.30. We're going to meet upstairs by the pool table. Um, it's an opportunity for us to socialize and get together. Um, and we are, uh, thanks to the BCCDC Foundation, fundraising uh, to um, actually collect stories from more conversion therapy survivors. So please help us sp spread the word um, about this really important campaign that's actually getting extended uh, to the end of this year. Uh, join me in thanking everyone on the panel. Um, really, really appreciate all of their time. <laughs> Uh, once again, I just want to thank uh, Travis and all of the panelists uh, for just sharing their stories and their perspectives. It's uh, so powerful and important. I didn't want to cut the session um, any earlier. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, we are a little bit behind schedule, about 10 minutes. So um, I'm going to ask folks to go to the concurrent sessions as soon as possible, and they'll actually... Um, I'll run until 5.40 instead of the 5.30, just to account for the 10 minutes. So, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>